Without further ado, the man of the hour, the guy that needs no introduction, but the man that has 12 nicknames, sliced bread, next gen Joe, smoking Joe on the car this weekend. Uh, Joe Logano joins us here on Stack of Pennies. How's it going? It's going good. We're bringing a whole new nickname back, back from the dead. Smoking Joe, it's back. <laughs> Didn't see it coming. I thought it was going to be next gen Joe with all your uh, peeling the wise off my race car during testing this winter. But hey, Smoke and Joe work this weekend. I think we got to stick with it. Well, I mean, you won the first next gen race. So next gen Joe isn't dead completely, but you were smoking Joe this weekend because that was an electric finish. Let's just not bury the lead. Let's get right into it. I think fans, because I everybody's been talking about it, right? Every recap show there is, Sirius XM Radio, you do behind the wheel. I'm, I'm sure you were breaking that down as well. But all the callers that I talked to on Tuesday were talking about like, all these different thoughts going through your head and the veterans versus the kids and Fords versus Chevys. And I'm trying to explain to these people, none of that stuff's going through Joey's head. He just feels <laughs> like he got stuck in the fence out of two and he's going to get a win. So over those like 15 laps, what were, what were you working through to try to get him one? And then what were you thinking about when you got there? Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I kind of said it right after the race and, and, and still holds true to, to this moment is, you know, once, you realize how the lead was taken away, right? By getting run up into the wall, um, which is, Hey, it's aggressive racing. That's it's fine. Right. I'm lucky I didn't get any tires cut down. I like to do my car was fine, but the facts that matter is he wouldn't have been in the lead if he didn't put me in the wall. So that's in your mind. Right. And I had 15 laps to stare at the back bumper of that 24 car to get even more pissed off and say, all right, I'm going to get there. And when I get there, I know what I'm going to do because he was willing to do that to take the lead. I'm going to be willing to do the same thing. You hit me, I'm going to hit you harder. That That is the driver code. That is how things work. And so it made my decision actually really easy on, on how to do it, right? So it's a lot more challenging question to figure out how to take the lead of a race and do it in a clean way because that, that's kind of the way you'd want to do it, right? Is, is, is to try to, how do I pass them without making any contact or at least find contact possible to win the race? Well, once it was taken away with contact, it's game on. And so, uh, you know, the last five, six laps, I really started catching them pretty quickly. And at that point, it was pretty uh, obvious what I was going to do. Obvious enough that he noticed it as well and <laughs> went in pretty low and slow because he knew it was coming. Uh, you know, and at that point, you know, I, I, I executed the bump and run. And, uh, and and made sure that we we're going to win the race. Um, you know that that was kind of the big thing. I, you you were out there, Corey. You know how it is. If, if you get in that wake the wrong way and you get tight, you lose three or four car lengths. And coming to the white flag, you can't take that risk because you're not going to make up this three or four car lengths and have a shot to win. So it was a, a pretty simple, easy decision to make. Well, I think some of it is tied to you're in the same position in Martinsville, right? And you got out and you gave William the bumper a little bit, which was probably the same amount of bumper you would give to him last year with the previous car. But this car needs way more force with that, that front bumper to the rear bumper to get the guy in front of you out of shape. So was that going through your mind of like, all right, I didn't hit him hard enough the first time to get a win. I'm definitely not going to be short the second time. No, I, I honestly, we – I thought the racing at Martinsville is completely different, right? Because we raced each other clean back and forth. And the, the bumper there is kind of a little bit more of a normal thing for one. And also too, I didn't go in there and clobber them out of the way, right? That wasn't going to be the thing. Now, like I said, when I got fenced, now it's like, okay, now I'm going to clobber you. Just, that's how it's going to work. Uh, and that's, that's how I would expect it. You know, if I'm going to move someone up out of the way, I'm, if they get back to me, you're going to be ready to be moved. Right. It's just, that's uh, the common. So, um, you know, I, I'm not sure I hit him any harder. It takes a lot less to move someone out of the way when you're going, you know, on a mile and a half, going a hundred something mile an hour. So we, so we, we talked about this, uh, just me and you on the phone call of like re what retaliation looks like, because, a lot of times the retaliation, whether it be when Chase and you got into it at Bristol, like the retaliation doesn't come back in like this big moment where it's tit for tat and William Byron wipes you out or wrecks you for a win the next week at Kansas necessarily. It's like these little tallies of times you race against each other and you have a great way to explain that. Like, so how do you anticipate or how do you race William going forward, knowing that he might have a tally on you, if you will? I mean, my opinion, we're even at this point, yeah. right? You, you got me, I got you. 
move on. Here we go. Um, I wouldn't want to keep going. I can tell you that much. So I think it's probably best uh, interest for both of us to to move on and keep going. Like like uh, you know we're we're even because at this point before that we didn't have a history at all. Um, so um, you know I, I think from here you just kind of move on. But um, you know to your point though, Corey, like there's just because you get wrecked or something like that doesn't mean you wreck them back uh, in all scenarios, right? It's it's sometimes you just make their life a living hell until things become equal. Right. And, and you're right though. Everyone keeps a, a tally uh, of some sort, right. All the drivers remember everything. <laughs> they don't remember the wins all the time, but they remember the losses all the time. And so th those things will, will always stick in your mind and, and how you handle those situations is, is key. So we'll shift gears a little bit away from Darlington and almost I want to I want to bring up the story that everybody's heard once or twice about me and you racing down the stairs at Darlington. <laughs> feel the ass off. You wanted to touch it. It's on YouTube. You can find it if you want the whole story. But I just I think that it's like complete circle that we went from two kids racing down, never even touched set foot at Darlington yet in our careers, and now we're at their racing. I got I got slapped by the lady in black this particular weekend. But man, you. Touched the asphalt and you conquered the lady in black. So what's it feel like getting that finally. first couple in the drawing team? Finally, finally. It's been close for so many times. But, uh, yeah, I don't consider it my first win there. I still consider I kicked your butt down the stairs that day. And I'm taking that as my first ever Darlington win. There's no trophy, but there was a witness there. It was you. You knew it happened. It may have been end over end across the finish line, but I got there first. It hurt. There was blood. There was tears. <laughs> there was victory but there was victory that's right so uh this one didn't hurt as much it felt good so i'm, I'm sure that was considerably way. better and it probably paid a bit better too in coca-cola chug points as i noticed the 19 chug point trophies behind you the undisputed <laughs> chug point champion yeah i always thought that it was like a myth of like you know people guys that are on the coke deal labels out like you didn't know that there's an actual competition going on apparently joe Ligano wins them all because he wins every year at chuck points well i mean i love winning um for one but yeah coke does a it's a it's a great um initiative behind it though i i obviously we love the the taste of coca-cola and everything it, it comes along with it but the, the it's all for charity they call it the chuck for charity program um so what you do is as as you do things um, to help promote the brand and promote what their their uh, initiatives are and what they're doing, uh, it turns into dollars to your charity of course of, of choice. Um, so wherever you as a driver uh, feel most um, you know willing to want to support, Coca Cola will help support that cause with you. So it's a really cool initiative that they have, and uh, it comes with a big trophy. If you do the most, you know, you get you get a cool trophy, and uh, so this works out pretty. This is Michael Foley's office. And so a big part of the, the chug points a lot of times is not just the driver, it's the support behind it. Make sure everything's all going right and, and doing all the right things. So Folly gets the trophies in, in his office here. It takes a whole so, this game of nuts. He's sitting next to me too. The whole deal. <laughs> I got I had a couple more things for you, and then I'll let you go. One is where we talked about mental health. It's mental aware, mental health awareness month being May. Uh, and that's kind of where Stack and Pains originated from, which is trying to figure out ways to stay motivated. Now, it's easy to be motivated when you're the guy holding the trophy from last Sunday at Darlington, right? But if you rewind and you went through some tough times when you came in as a rookie driving that 20 Home Depot car, you kind of went through a time, do I, do I drive an extended, a Bush car? Do I go? And it, the, 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 the way kind of led you to the 22, right? And next thing you know, you're a Cup Series champion, and a future Hall of Famer. So how do you now, I guess, just feel like find the confidence when you're not running well, you feel like you're not getting as much as you get, maybe you question your abilities, uh, you know, so like, how do you, how do you deal with mental health, that mental health aspect? Yeah. I mean, I, the mental game in sports is, is the most important part of it, right? I mean, it, a lot of us at this level can go fast, right? Like, but Corey and my car is going to go just as fast as me, right? Like I, I, we're all similar drivers and talent level. When you get to the cup level, everybody's really, really good. So how do you separate yourself and become better than the next guy, right? You have to figure out what makes you tick. 
What's what is the the thing that that sets you apart? What uh, makes you um, you know that brings that little competitive fire in there? Um, and at this point in my career, it's probably a little bit easier because I have some. What's up, Levi? <laughs> But I say that at this point in my career, I have a little bit of history behind me, right? To where I say, hey, I know how to win races. I've won races before. I've won a championship. I know what I'm doing. But it doesn't mean I still don't go in a slump and I still question myself, um, right? It's just, it's, I feel like that stuff's just natural to a certain extent, um, right? I've just snapped a 40 race winless streak, uh, right? And that's, that's tough, right? I'm used to winning and, you know, you're in a car that should be winning and, you know, you, you have to not only keep yourself motivated, but you have to keep your team motivated and keep everybody fired up in the right direction. So, um, you know, that it's, it's a challenge, but I think the biggest thing for me is just understanding, um, you know, what makes you tick and it's different for everyone. So for me to give advice on this, it's kind of challenging because you have to learn yourself and your situation and what your goal is for that day and six months from now and two years from now and five years from now. Uh, and, and what does success look like? Well, that changes for everybody too. And, and I'm glad you brought that up because that was my next thing. It's like, if, if you said that you didn't think about where your collective career ends up at the end of it, I think anybody, any race car driver, any crew chief would be lying to you, right? Because everybody wants to stack up and what feels like is one of the greatest at their particular job. So how, Often do you find yourself comparing to guys that in your particular age and stage of your career to guys that are current Hall of Famers, guys that you're comparing yourself to, to active drivers at the moment? How much Hall of Fame thoughts go through your head right now? A fair amount. <laughs> um, because it, I, I think that all-time win list is something that, that I like to look at um, and see where you stack up, right? So now I think I'm 29th after uh, I'm tied. Uh, for 20 X White and Carl Edwards. And, you know, it's a, obviously a pretty cool group to be a part of right there, right? Both uh, amazing race car drivers, uh, Rex being a champion as well. So um, special to be a, a part of, of that group. But, you know, you also look at, okay, what's ahead of me? You know, where, where's the next one? How can I you know, move up this chart more? Um, you know, that, that's something that, that I look at. But you bring up Hall of Famer. And I guess that's where I get sometimes a little conflicted on, on what is considered a hall of famer, right? Like at what point in your career, are you a hall of famer because you won races or because you've promoted and progressed your sport into a better place than it was. when you got there to me, that's a hall of famer, right? Like, to, like when we won the championship in 2018, I got to sit on the board of everybody. I don't know. There's 50 people or so that, go there and say, this person should be on the ballot. This person should, should be in because of this and this and this. And everyone had different reasons for what a hall of famer was. And I guess trying to understand the definition of that was one of the biggest things for me while I was there. And I enjoyed that, but uh, I think everyone has a different definition of what hall of famer is. But to me, I think it's somebody that moves the sport forward, even post their career, right? Like, it's easy for us now because we're kind of in the take mode, right? We're, we're racing, we're in the sport, we're doing everything. We're trying to win all this, this, these races and the stats and rack all this stuff up. But if you're not in that process doing that, but also looking at the next generation and saying, how do we make this even better? Because if it wasn't for people thinking that way, me and you, Corey, we're not sitting here. We don't have a cool sport to race in, right? We're, we're doing something different. Uh, so I think keeping that in the forefront of your mind to me, makes a hall of famer we had a debate earlier in the show and you don't you don't have to make an elaborated answer but the, the hypothetical or the hot take was this and i brought it up joey logano is the new age dale earnhardt intimidator status <laughs> um okay <laughs> i take it you know i i, I think that the number one thing is just be you be who you are right and, and embrace it right like Corey, you do it better than anybody, right? I'm just that's Corey, right? Like that's you're the same person you were when we grew up together. Nothing's changed. Whatever the heck goes into your mind comes straight out of your mouth, right? We just know that's the legit way of doing it. And this is this is me. Like this, I'm gonna be happy. I'm gonna have a good time. I'm gonna joke around, but I'm gonna be a fierce competitor. And that's that's who I am. And I, I can flip the switch. Right? I can turn it on and off. 
when I need to. And I think that's a good thing, right? I like that. I think it's hard for people to understand sometimes, but that's me. So um, you can compare me to whoever you want. I, I think that's okay and kind of cool, right? If you're going to get compared to someone, that would be the one, right? But I think the number one thing is just being the best Joey Logano you can be. Well, and you've been consistently Joey Logano, smoking Joe, next gen Joe, sliced bread, all of them combined into one, getting the first win of the year. One last thing, and and uh, I'll let you go. I'm keeping you along because it's been a fun conversation. Absolutely. Last year's question was if you get to pick one car and one racetrack to race at the rest of your life, what do you go with? I forgot what your answer was. But this year's question is what is the most embarrassed you've been at the racetrack? Ooh, um, can I tell an embarrassing story that was at the race shop, but it involved the race car? Yeah. This is, this is number one most embarrassing story of my life. Um, so I'm 15 years old, 14 or 15 years old. And at the time I was running uh, the Pro Cup series and we had pit stops. And so Roush was uh, kind of had like a development pit crew. And so we had a little deal with them that was working pretty good that, they were helped develop some of their people on our pit crew. So we'd go down to the race shop and practice. And so I thought it was cool. I'm 15 years old. I'm driving a cup car for pit practice. I'm, it's cool. And uh, so they had a brand new one, pretty, had all the color changing, you know, uh, paint on it. It is nice. So you never see a brand new pit car these days. This thing was pretty. And so they let us use it. And so I backed up, got going into the pit stall pushing the clutch, I put it in neutral and my foot gets wedged behind the brake pedal and on top of the clutch. And I'm like, uh-oh, and I can't get my foot out of there. <laughs> I, I, I'm stuck, right? My foot's stuck. Like, oh no. So it's straight through the pit stall. And then there's a, <laughs> there's a row of tires and then there's the fence. And I straight through the tires, right through them, right into the fence. And it had the, like the electric fence there, right? The, the motorized fence. I, <laughs> destroy the fence, knock the radiator out of this car. And then, so it's embarrassing enough, but the most embarrassed part is now you got to push the car back into the garage where everybody's working on their race cars for the weekend. And here's Joey pushing this thing saying, oh my God, my racing career is over before it even started. It's, it is bad. Um, so yes, good luck topping that embarrassing story. That was, that was bad. <laughs> <laughs> and, and everybody knows the story. He shortly thereafter started driving for Joe Gibbs after that. <laughs> True. <laughs> True. <laughs> Dude, great, great stuff. Have a great week. Thanks for jumping on here, Stacking Pennies. Yeah, thank you. Anytime. Thanks for having me, man. See you.